الله <laughs> There are many blessings in reciting through the Pak upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam. The final Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam is reported to have said that whoever recites Salat upon me 1,000 times in a day, he will not die until he has seen his place in paradise. Sallu alal Habibs. Please make a habit viewers on the channel and brothers here. Of reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now a thousand might seem like a lot. You know this thousand figure, it seems like a lot. But if, if before every namaz, you recite 100. After every namaz, you recite 100. Five times a day, 1,000 is recited. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that you will see, you will see your place in paradise before you die. Meaning, you have a place in paradise. So inshallah, please make a habit of reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We said it many times before, but who knows that one extra through the part that we recite today might make all the difference on the day of judgment. It's narrated that the renowned companion Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrates. He said that the final Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi would keep fast and he would offer great amounts of salah to the extent that his blessed feet would swell. Ummul Mu'mineen Sayyidina Aisha Sadiqa radiallahu ta'ala once said, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never left Qiyam al Dal, i.e. offering nafil salah at night. If he was unwell, he would sit and pray. It is narrated also by Umm al-Mu'mineen Sayyidina Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala that the blessed practice of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was to offer salah at night and then to sleep for the same amount of time that he had prayed. Then he would wake up and he would offer for salah for as long as he had slept he would then sleep again for as long as he had offered salah and this practice continued the whole of the night until Fajr. So imagine he would worship Allah for one hour and go to sleep for one hour. Worship Allah for one hour, go to sleep for one hour. And that the whole night he would continue doing this until Fajr had happened. Sayyidina Jabir radiallahu explains the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi would use miswak as soon as he woke up. He would perform wuzu and he would offer salah. The companion Sayyidina Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala beautifully narrates that one night the final Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was offering salah in the masjid. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was offering salah in the masjid and this companion thought to himself that you know what I'll stand behind. I'll stand behind the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa this is a great opportunity to read my salah with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa because the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was reading it out loud. He was reading the Quran and the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa started with Surah Baqarah. And when he started reciting Surah Baqarah, this companion thought to himself that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will read a hundred verses. But then after a hundred verses, he continued. And then he thought to himself that he would go to 200 verses and then go into Ruku. But again, he did not so. And when this occurred, I now thought to myself that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would read the whole of Surah Baqarah. But when Surah Baqarah was complete, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam still did not perform Ruku. And he started on Surah Al-Imran. Again, I thought to myself, he would read the whole entire Surah and perform Ruku. But as I finished reciting Surah Al-Imran, he began reciting Surah Al-Nisa. Upon reaching the end of Surah Al-Nisa, he began reciting Surah Al-Maida. And only after finishing this Surah, did the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam go into Ruku. Allah Akbar. He said, I all heard him reciting in the Ruku in the second unit of Salah and he began reciting Surah Al-Anam after that as well. My dear Islam brothers and viewers of the channel, from this we see that the intercessor of the Ummah, the master of both worlds, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would worship Allah with such 
diligence, such passion that he would give this much time. Look at the amount of time that he would give in worshipping Allah Azza wa Now what we need to remember here is that this was not a person that was free. You know, someone that's got all the time, you know, he's got nothing else to do. He's free, he's got no roles, no responsibilities. If he just worships Allah, just reads the Quran, he's got nothing else to do. We are talking here about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, if you've got a house to run, you've got a family to look after, you've got to give time to your mother and your father, you've got to give time to your spouse, you've got to give time to your children. It takes your time. But here we're talking about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final messenger, who was giving tarbiyat, to the fellow Muslims, he was inviting people to the call of Islam. He was giving Nikki Kitawat. He was busy all day, and yet he still found time to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla. This mindset that he had, this practice that he had of making sure that he fulfilled his role in society, of calling people to Islam, explaining the tenets of Islam to people, meeting people, meeting these kafirs that were coming to him, instructed them to tell them to go and spread the message of Islam, but at the same time. He would find time to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now if we look at ourselves, if we look at our lives, when it comes to making money, we have loads of time. We have time to make money. When it comes to go on trips and have leisure and enjoy ourselves, we have time. When it comes to using our phones and going through social media, then all of a sudden an hour disappears and we're not bothered. You know, you're on social media and you're there for an hour, an hour and a half and okay, never mind, okay. Sure, I was on for about an hour and a half. Okay, never mind. We don't feel guilty. We have time to go around and watch sports events, no matter how long it is. You know, people, when they say to you, come to the weekly ishtama, and they say to you, how long is the ishtama? And you say, it's going to be 90 minutes, inshallah. Oh, 90 minutes. And then what happens? People come to the ishtama and they complain afterwards. You said it was going to be 90 minutes. It took 100 minutes. Instead of 90 minutes, it was 1 hour 45. Instead of 90 minutes, it was 2 hours. And they complain about it. Them same people... They never complain when football goes to extra time. Then some people never complain when there's extra time at football, or it goes to penalties or something. They never complain then. But they complain then because, oh, I have to get home early. I have to go to work in the morning. You went on for an extra 10 minutes. You said it would finish at half past nine. Why is it all of a sudden we can't find time? We can't find time to do all of these things. But when it comes time to worshipping Allah, we've got no time. We've got no time. And one thing we need to realize, that every Muslim has time. It's an excuse we make. We make this excuse about our time. I've not got time. No matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how healthy you are, whatever your status is, you've all got 24 hours in a day. The problem is how we utilize that time. And here we, you know, in, in the booklet that I'm reading, it's talking about the nafal prayers and the jash and the ishraq and the hajjat and all of these things. But I'm thinking to myself, when I was reading, I was thinking to myself, forget that. As Muslims nowadays, we haven't even got time for the faraid. We make excuses that we haven't got time to go to the masjid and read our salah. And we make excuses. And unfortunately, what has happened to us, my dear Islam, is that our deen, and I've said it before, our deen has become a hobby. You know, a hobby, I mean, people that know me know that I have a hobby that I like cars. And I've got, I bought an old sports car about four years ago to restore, I put it in the yard, I put a sheet over it. I've never had time to look at it, it's my hobby. And I keep on saying to him, one of these days I'll get to it, one of these days I'll get to it. But unfortunately we made our deen like that. When I've got time, I'll read my salah. When I've got time, I'll read the Quran. And what happens is we never have time. We never have time when we make this excuse, I haven't got time. It's because what's happened is our deen has become a hobby. Our deen has not become our life. And our life, should revolve around our deen and what is happening is our deen is revolving around our life. We put our priorities there and if we've got time, then we'll perform the salah. Oh, you know what, Fajr is a bit early now. I'm going to struggle in the morning to get up for work. No, I'll miss Fajr. Isha is a bit late now, I need to get to bed early. During Maghrib, I'm going to see my mates, we're going out for a meal, I ain't got time for Maghrib. We we'll make all these excuses, you have time. And you make all these excuses. The month of Ramadan comes, you see the timetable is issued by the masjid and you think, oh, you know what, I've got overtime on that day and that, I can't fast on that day. And all, you know, before, as soon as the timetable comes out, we're already making excuses not to fast on certain days during the month of Ramadan. We're already finding excuses not to perform the Tarawih prayers in the month of Ramadan. 
When the time comes to pay our zakat, we're already making excuses. Oh, I need to get my kitchen extension done. I need to buy that goatee back home. I need to pay this off my car. I need to get this sorted. And we make excuses not to pay our zakat. When it comes to hajj, which is further upon you, we make excuses. Oh, I need to get my daughter married. I need to get the kitchen extension done. I need to get the house built back home. We make all these excuses. None of them excuses will remove the fact from the you that hajj is further upon you. These excuses don't wash. On the day of judgment, when you asked, why did you not perform the hajj? I had to build a kitchen extension. Do you think that's going to wash? Do you think that's going to be accepted on the day of judgment? We make these excuses. You can make them excuses to me. You can make a fool out of me and convince me, brother, I can't go on hajj because of this. I can't come to the masjid because of this. I can't fast because of this. You can make a fool out of me. But it won't happen on the day of judgment. Them excuses won't wash. And as Muslims, we need to look at our time. Value our time. Because our time is limited. And we need to understand this. You know, if I was to say to you that you can work up to a certain age. You know, this country, they talk about 65, 67 is the pension age. Forget that for a moment. If I was to say to you, you can work up to a certain age. Up until that age, you can earn as much money as you want. But when that time comes, after that, you can't earn any money. Now, what's the first question you're going to ask me? When is that going to happen? When's that time where I'm going to stop working? If I say to you, I don't know. It could happen when you're 20. It could happen when you're 30. It could happen when you're 40. It could happen when you're 50. It could happen when you're 80. But when that time comes, I'm going to phone you up and you're going to be unemployed. Now, how would you live your life? Do you think, you know what? I need to make as much money as I can. Because as soon as I become an employed and I can't work anymore, that means I can't make any more money. So I'm going to have to survive on that money for the rest of my life. That money that I've got, I'm going to have to survive on it. So you work as hard as you can to make as much money as you can. What about the good deeds and the angel of death? The angel of death can come at any time. And whatever deeds you perform, you're going to have to survive on them in the afterlife. So in the same way, we work so hard to try and accumulate as many, much money as possible in that short period of time, in the same way we should try our best to accumulate as many good deeds as possible in this short period of time. And in the same way, in the example that I give you, I'm not going to tell you when you're going to retire. In the same way, Allah Azawajal is not telling us when the angel of death will come to us. So we need to change this mindset inside us. I'm not saying to you don't earn money. I'm not saying to you, get, you don't get your kitchen extension done. I'm not saying to you don't buy that koti back home. I'm not saying these things. But what I am saying to you is, get your priorities right. You can build as many coaches as you want back home. You can make a, the whole of this building here can be your kitchen as far as I'm concerned. But as long as you fulfill the rights. You know, living in this dunya, earning money in this dunya. A pious person, he said to me once, he said that, look, if in this dunya, whatever you earn, as long as you earn it by halal means, there is no harm in becoming a millionaire or a billionaire, as long as, as long as it does not distract you from what you are supposed to do. Fulfilling your rights, fulfilling the farai that is upon you. If you make any money or you do anything in this dunya, and as a result of that, it stops you performing your farai, then that is not good for you. That is not good for you. And that's what we need to do. You know, Mulana Jalaluddin Rumi, he says that if a king sends you for a specific task, a king gives you a job to do, but on the way, you become engrossed with other things to the point that you forget the task that the king sent you for, will the king be pleased with you? For example, if I was to say to you, I put it in modern terms, that your dad says to you, look, Beta, can you go to the shop? I want you to go to the shop and I want you to go and get some milk and bread. This is your job. So you go out of the house, so you go down the street and you see people playing football. So you start going playing football with them. And then you oh yeah, dad told me to go and get the bread and milk. You come back and you start, and then you start people playing cricket. You go play cricket, then you start going to the cinema. You go here, you go there. And what happens, you forget what your dad told you to do. And then you come home. Will your father be happy with you? He won't. Allah Azza wa has told us what we need to do in this dunya. We forget. We get distracted in this dunya. And this is where the problem is. We get distracted in this dunya. 
We forget our role, our purpose in this life. What are we born to be? What are we born to be? I'll tell you. We are born to die. That's what Muslims are. We are born to die. I mean, you do not know when that day will come. We are born to die. And in this time, you have to fulfill your role and prepare yourself. All our lives, we should be preparing for ourselves for that day when we will die. Because that is going to happen. That is the inevitability. That is the only fact that we have on life. I do not know what time I will get home today. I do not know what I will eat today. I do not know what breakfast I will have to... I know nothing. I can guess. I can guess. But there's no certainty. The only certainty that we have in life is death. That's the only certainty that we have in life. And we forget that this is our role. We forget that we need to do these things. But we don't forget to eat. We don't forget to drink. We don't forget to buy new clothes. We don't forget to, you know, upgrade our mobile phone to the newest mobile phone. We're looking at what the newest mobile phones are. We don't forget to buy new accounts. We don't forget all of these things. But what we do forget is our role. We do forget what purpose we've got in our life. And we need to worry. We need to start to think about this. Because that time will happen, my dearest God, brothers and viewers on the channel, where you will enter your dark and lonely grave. You won't have your mobile phone then. You won't have your friends then. You won't have your colleagues then. You won't have your business then. You won't have your family then. You will have nothing. It will be you, yourself and you. And that day will come. Whether you like it or you do not like it, it will come. And what has happened is, is we kind of forget it. You know the psychologists, they say that in the human mind, there are boxes. We have boxes in our head and each box we open every now and then. Like I said, I've got a box in my head somewhere about restoring cars. I can't remember the last time I opened it, but it's there. It is there in my mind. Yeah, you, whatever job you have, you may be a driver, you may be a cook, whatever it is, there's a box inside your mind that has in there all of the memories, the knowledge that you have about cooking. If you're a driver, it has all the knowledge and knowledge that you have about driving. In the same way, there is a box inside your head that you don't open very often, but it's there. And that's the box of death. It's there. What happens is every time someone passes away, we open that box. And we think about it, and we get worried about it, and we see the dead body, we go to the graveyard, and for a few moments we think about death, and then we close the box. We not only close the box, we push the box right to the back of our mind. Because we don't want to open that box. We're scared of that box. But that box is there. We're in denial. We're denying that that box exists. We're denying that that time will come. We think we're going to live forever. But no matter what age you are today, every one of you will know someone that has passed away at your age or younger than you. You will all know these people. You will all know these people. So do you think you're immune? Do you think it's not going to come to you? Do you think that that time will not come to you? Are you not afraid what will happen in that dark and lonely grave? Are you ready for that dark and lonely grave? Are you prepared for that time? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa beautifully once said, he said, if you were to get water on your finger, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, if you get water on your finger, this water that is on your finger, that is the dunya. Next time, middle of the day, when it's nice and warm, dip your finger in some water and look at it. The water will dry up eventually. But the hadith doesn't finish there. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you get water on your finger, that's the dunya. The ocean, that's the afterlife. We're running after this. I'm not running after that. You know, if you were to think about it in a logical term, that we are so foolish that we're running after something that's going to dry up in seconds. You can stand out in the midday sun and your, water, your finger will dry up. The oceans don't dry up. This dries up, but we're running after this. And this is where we need to change our mindset. We need to change our mindset to realize this. Allah Azza wa has told us in the Quran, in Surah al dariyat verse 56, And I have created jinn and human beings only for this, that they should worship me. That is your role. That is your job. That is your job description. You know, as I said earlier on, when people create a, seat, you know, a job description for a job, at the top they'll put the title, you know, Chartered Accountant. And then they'll have all the details below of your job that you're going to fulfill. 
In hours at the job, it says born to die, and then it'll have all the details of what you need to do to fulfill your role. The commandments, the, the, the sunnah, all of these things are there in the job description. We need to be aware of what our job description is. We need to be aware of what our role is, and unfortunately we don't. Again, we push it to one side. It is stated that Sayyidina Sufyan bin Uyana said that he would offer salah all night, sit down at the time of sword and cry before Allah Azza wa He would beseech that this is what we are created to do. If our end is not upon goodness, we shall be ruined. The people of the past, what they had, they had a mindset that when they would worship Allah Azza wa no matter how much they would worship Allah Azza wa they still have the fear in their heart. Nowadays we think, oh, I've been on Hajj. I've been on Hajj. I go on Umrah every year. I fast during the month of Ramadan. I go to the Travis. I read a Quran in the month of Ramadan. I'm sorted. I got it made. No, you haven't made. You haven't got it made. No matter how much ibadat you do, no matter how much ibadat you do, it'll only be through the mercy of Allah Azza wa There was a person from the Bani Israel. He worshipped Allah Azza wa for 500 years. He worshipped Allah Azza wa on the top of a mountain for 500 years and every day he would come down the mountain and Allah Azza wa would provide him a big pomegranate to eat and pure water would go past and he would drink from that. And when he passed away, when he passed away, Allah Azza wa said, through my mercy, through my mercy, make him into paradise. And the person said, Ya Rab, I worship you for 500 years. Through, surely it's through my worship that I'm entering paradise. Again, Allah Azza wa said, through my mercy, make him enter paradise. And again, the person said, Ya Rab, I worship you for 500 years. Come on. Surely it's through my ibadah that I'm going into paradise. And Allah Azza wa said, okay. I'll take your ibadat for the blessings that I've given you. The blessings of your eye is equivalent to 500 years worship. Now he's left with nothing. And Allah Azza wa says, take him to the hellfire. And then the person pleaded, Ya Allah, through your mercy, through your mercy, enable me to enter paradise. Think about the blessings that me and you have. That if Allah Azza wa was to, we had to recompense for these blessings. The blessings of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the hands, the fact that I can speak to you, the fact that you can hear me, the fact that I walked into this room today. Are these not blessings? What price can you put on eyesight? What price can you put on hearing? I've said it many times before, what price can you even put on a thumb? I've used this example, I'll use it again, I've used it so many times, that if you do not know how lucky you are when you go home tonight, put some tape around your hand. Try and live your life like that for one hour. Try and lift a cup of tea. Try and use your keys. Try open the door and you realize how lucky you are that Allah has blessed you with a thumb. Forget about the hand, the arms, the ears, the nose, the eyes. Allah has given us so much. What have you done in return? What have we done in return? May Allah give us the ability to worship Allah as it should be worshipped. There was a companion of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was passing away, Sayyidina Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu anhu. When he was passing away, he began to shed tears. He began to shed tears, and when people asked him, "Why are you crying at this time? Why are you crying? Is it because you're crying because the angel of death is coming to you? Are you crying because you're about to die?" He said, "No, I'm crying." Because I will now not be able to fast on hot days. I will not be able to perform salah on cold nights. I will not be able to attend those circles of zikr that are held by the scholars. The fact that you are here today, you are very, very lucky. You know, I said at the beginning that you need to thank Allah that you are here. The Prophet of Allah said that on the day of judgment, there'll be thrones made of pearls and rubies and people will be sitting on them. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said that those people that are sitting there, they will not be martyrs. Then people that were sitting there, they will not be prophets. So the companion said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who will those fortunate people be that are sitting on thrones made of pearls and rubies? And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, there will be those fortunate people who came from different places, came from different families, gathered together to remember Allah Azza wa for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa 
I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla that we here are in such a gathering that we come together from different families, from different places. We come here to remember Allah Azza wa Jalla for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And inshallah Azza wa Jalla, I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla that we're accepted amongst those people that will sit on those thrones made of pearls and rubies. It is stated that we accompanied the Messenger of Allah on a battle and we came across a mountainous region when returning in which he ordered us to stay. Every companion did as instructed in order to rest. Allah's Messenger then instructed the companions, he said to them that we need someone to stay guard at night. So one person from the Ansar and the Muhajirin, they lifted their hands and said, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi we will stay guard tonight. So they said, okay. So the two companions, they said to each other, look, one of you rest, you rest and I'll stay guard. So the Ansar, he stayed guard. The Ansar, he stayed guard. But whilst he was staying guard, a thought came to that, you know what, I'm here now. I might as well do some ibadat as well. So he stood up and started reading a salah. Now the enemy saw him and shot an arrow in his leg. He didn't flinch. The enemy then saw a second arrow in his leg. He didn't flinch. A third arrow came and it went into his shoulder. And when the third arrow went to his shoulder, he went into Ruku and completed his salah and then woke up his companion. And when he woke up his companion, the enemy saw that there was two of them and he ran away. So his companion saw that he was wounded. He saw that this had happened to him and he said, why didn't you wake me up? Three arrows. I didn't hear you. Why did you not say anything? He said, I began reciting the Quran. I began reciting the Quran and I didn't feel right. You know, I'm finishing in the middle of a surah. And if it was not for the fact that the Prophet of Allah told us to stay guard, I would have continued reading the Quran the whole night, even if it took my life away. You know, these people that when they worshipped Allah, you know, people talk about nowadays being in the zone. I don't know if you've heard that time, being in the zone. I remember I used to work in, uh, in a place and I used to write software. And they used to say to me that when you're writing software, you become in a zone. And what that means basically is that you're so much concentrating on what you're doing, you don't realize what's happening to your left and your right. And they used to joke with me, they said that, you know, when you're doing writing your software, we're calling your name, you're not hearing us. If a bomb was to blow up, you wouldn't hear it. And so when you read about the events of these pious people, that when they were worshipping Allah, anything could happen to them, and they wouldn't know about it. There was one person that he was wounded in his foot. The foot had gangrene, and they wanted to amputate his foot, but he refused. So the people got together and said, you know what, when he's reading his salat, then amputate his foot. Why? Because he won't feel anything. He's in that zone, he's completely there. When we're reading Ha Salah, where are we? We remember everything that we've lost. We remember everything that we're supposed to do. Sayyidina Rabia Basri, once she had a dream. And in this dream, she saw a massive tree with beautiful fruit on it. And she started walking around the tree. And she said, whose tree is this? And she heard a voice from the unseen, that this tree is yours because of the zikr that you do, the askar that you do, beautiful tree. She then saw some of the fruit on the floor had fallen off the tree. Some of the fruit had fallen off the tree onto the floor. And she asked, why is this fruit on the floor? Why is it not on the tree? And the reply was that when you were doing the zikr of Allah, for a short moment of time, you started to think about the bread that you dored and whether the bread was ready to cook or not. And so because your mind was over there, you lost this reward. You know, when I read that, I thought to myself, you know, when we perform our salah, where's our mind? What are we thinking about? You know, I need to get petrol in the car. Wife told me to pick up some milk on the way home. I need to go to the takeaway. I need to pay these bills. I need to, all these things come to your mind. When was the last time that we read our salah? Just read one, two units of salah and it was purely focusing on our salah. I find it very hard, I'll be honest with you. Maybe you're all a lot better than me, but I struggle to fully concentrate on my salah. And after I read that, every time I try my best to concentrate on my salah. But we see the people of the past, they did it. And because they did it, they got the full benefit of worshipping Allah. They had that full benefit of this. But at the same time, my dearest brothers and viewers of my children, if you don't get that full pleasure or the full 
whatever it is that, you, that we should try and get, never give up your salah. Never give up your salah. Even if they think, they say, well, I'm not getting anything from it. I'm not feeling any spiritual benefit from it. I'm not getting any insight to it. I'm not getting any ruhaniyat in it. Even then, never ever give up your salah. Because this idea of you not getting any benefit from it is a whisper of shaitan. Shaitan doesn't want you to read his salah. Shaitan will make all of these excuses. Oh yeah, you've gone to the shtama, he's told you you need to read the salah. Okay, I'll tell you what, Ramzan's coming. Let's start reading namaz in Ramzan. This is what shaitan will tell you. And you go, oh, that's a good idea. I'll start reading my namaz in Ramadan. You know, in one way, that's the worst thing that you can do. I'll explain. You know, if a person has missed his salah, and he's calculated how many salah he's missed, then what he should do, he should make an intention to make up for that salah. He should make an intention to make up for that salah and start reading it. And if the angel of death comes to him, then he's dying. He dies in the state that he's made an intention to make up for all of the missed salah and all of the missed fast. And inshallah, Allah will reward him for that. But if you don't read salah today and you make an intention that I will start reading my salah in Ramadan, sounds good, doesn't it? You've made an intention to sin from now to Ramadan. Have you thought about that? You have made an intention that I am not going to perform my salah from now to Ramadan. You've made that intention. And if you die in that state. So whenever you make an intention, don't make it for tomorrow or the day after. People say, oh, I'll start reading my salah on Friday. Forget Friday. If you've not read Salat al-Isha tonight, read it before you go to bed. Because all of these are whispers of shaitan. And then what will happen is if you make this intention to start your salah in Ramadan, Ramadan will come. And what will happen is, you'll miss one salah, and you think, well, I've missed one, what's wrong if I've missed two? What's the difference between one and two? I've not been reading my salah all my life. So I've missed one, what's happened if I miss two? Then you miss three, then you miss four, and then you'll be back to normal. In the same way, shaitan will entice you. You need to read the Quran during the month of, you make an intention, I'm going to read the Quran during the month of Ramadan. Start reading it now. A person that runs a marathon, he doesn't just turn up at the starting line. He trains and plans and gets ready for that day. Reading our namaz five times a day, reading the Quran on a daily basis, reciting the Pak upon the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, optional fast, all of these things, getting you ready for that time where you can get the ultimate reward. If it was the dunya, you plan and you train and you get everything ready for that time. But when it comes to the akhirat, we forget about it. And as Muslims, we don't realize that Allah azza wa jalla has blessed us with these. You are blessed with an opportunity to remember your Rabb five times a day. You are blessed with an opportunity, the Friday verse, to gather together as Muslims. You are blessed with the nights of Shabbat Baraj, Shabbat Miraj, Laylatul Qadr. You are blessed with the months of Ramadan. You have all of these blessings. And all of these blessed days, nights, weeks, months, all of these blessings, all of these are opportunities to get closer to our Rabb and still we walk away. Everything's been given to you. All of these opportunities are given to you. So my dear Islam brothers, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, warn to him who a month of Ramadan comes and a month of Ramadan goes and he fails to get his sins forgiven. A golden opportunity is coming to the Ummah of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, unfortunately, there are many amongst us that will not see this month of Ramadan as an opportunity. They'll see this month of Ramadan as a burden. Hi, hi, hi. Fasting. 16 hour fast. How am I going to manage? And we'll look for the Imam that recites the shortest Travi. He finishes in 30 minutes. He finishes in 40 minutes. No, I'll go to the 30 minute one. You know, we'll make up, we'll look for the one that has the shortest Travi. And we'll make all sorts of excuses. And again, you know, I remember I used to live in this town. So I'll mention something about this particular town that I had from my memory. I remember going to the Travi during the month of Ramadan. And I used to see a, a lot of the youngsters. Uh, that were in the takeaways at the time for Travi. And what had happened is, and this is why I'm saying to you, because please don't do this. They would leave home, they're telling the mom, I'm going to read my Travi, and they'd go and sit in the takeaways. And then they'd wait for all the people to come out of the masjid, and then they would go home. Please don't do this. You know, whatever your age is, don't do this. This is a golden opportunity for you. You know, the people of the past, they would do dua, Ya Allah, bless us with Ramadan. For six months, they would do this dua, Ya Allah, bless us with the month of Ramadan. And then after Ramadan, what would they do? Again, this mindset I want to mention to you. They would do this dua, Ya Allah, whatever good we have done, accept it. We think we've done it and it's done. 
you know, we, we read the Quran, don't tick box reward in my bank account. How do you know it's been accepted? How do you know that Hajj, that Umrah, the Zakat, everything you've done has been accepted? We don't know. So we need to do dua, Ya Allah, accept this. We need to have that fear of Allah in our hearts that we do not know whether it's been accepted. And this is why we see the people of the past that they would constantly strive to worship Allah Azawajal because they had this fear in their heart that maybe this has not been accepted. And then we also know, we also come to know that shaitan will never give up on you. Shaitan, when you're on your deathbed, he will try and take your iman away from you. And the greatest gift that a Muslim has is his iman. And if your iman is lost, you've lost everything. Are we aware as Muslims what we need to do to protect our iman? Are we aware of what we do that can enable us to lose our iman? These are the things that we need to learn. You know, in this country, they say that if you want to get insurance on your house, you need five lever locks. Islam has given us five lever locks to protect our iman. The insurance companies say that if you want a cheaper insurance, a better insurance, possibly, you need seven lever and nine lever locks. We'll give you the locks. Tahajjat, Chasht, Ishraq, Awabin, reading the Quran, Zikr, Eskar, all of these are locks on your Iman. And the question is, is what locks have we put on our Iman? What locks have we put on to secure our Iman? This is your personal question. Amir al the founder of Dal Islami Ammadani channel, he says that the war against Shaitan will continue. I've said it before, what is this war? This war is not, I'll give you all a baseball bat and we'll go on to Derby Street later on. This is not the war. This war against shaitan is your war. And that war against shaitan will start tomorrow at 7 o'clock. That's your first battle. That's the battlefield. 7 o'clock in the morning. The question is, is are you going to win that battle? Or are you going to lose that battle? It's up to you. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, say to yourself, did I win or did shaitan win? And then there's another battle, 1.30, another battle, 4 o'clock. Another battle, five past five. These are all battles against shaitan that you need to win. And if you don't win, then shaitan is winning. And that's the mindset you need to have inside yourself. That when I miss my salah, shaitan is winning. When I perform my salah, I've given a good punch to shaitan. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla that I've sent it to me. Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive me. Ameen bi jahin nabi ameen. Sallu alal habib. Oh, well, for you, it's my prayer. Oh, well, for you, it's my prayer. May you keep a